So to begin the conference, we would like to welcome Bella, uh, European queer youth herself, CEO of the Shoutout, uh, to moderate our first panel, which is on sparking impact of the queer youth activism in our regions. Bella, the floor is yours. Thank you so much, Petra. I am delighted to bring forth our panel, which is an excellent array of um, people who have many different experiences working in this area um, and, and chat to them a little bit about their experiences. Um, a couple of things I just want to point out again, just uh, for anybody who has uh, missed my name is Bella. My pronouns are she and her. I'm the CEO of an organization called Shoutout. Um, for roughly the next 40 minutes, uh, we will involve different speakers to engage in discussion on youth-led strategies to navigate through challenges faced by LGBTQ plus youth um, with the team of sparking impact. How do we spark impact? Hopefully these discussions will reflect the ones we will hold over the next two days. Um, just a bit of housekeeping. If you do have any questions for the panelists, please use the Q&A function, which you'll find at the bottom of your Zoom screen um, in order to um, submit a question. That makes it a lot easier for us. If you have just a, a general <laughs> thought, you could put that in the chat. That might be a little bit easier. Um, and we, we would love any participation um, through the Signal group as well, if that's something you have joined uh, as well. So I'm really delighted to, to be joined by Torin, uh, Sultan and Oscar. Uh, I will also point out that me and Oscar are both uh, last name Fitzpatrick, but we are not related. It is just an extremely common name and we're both from Ireland. Now, um, Oscar, I'm gonna leave you to last to introduce yourself um, because you, you just did, but We'd love to hear more as well. Um, so I'm going to go first to Sultan. Could you tell us a, just a little bit of an introduction of yourself um, uh, and your pronouns, if you could? Hello, everyone. Uh, so you can call me Sultan, uh, and my pronouns are he, him. I go the easiest way. <laughs> um, yeah, um, so I'm an activist from Kazakhstan. Uh, I I'm not affiliated with any organization. Uh, so my activism started as just a student activism and I was the first one who put the stone on visibility and in LGBTQI and feminist movement at Nazarbayev University. As you know, probably this university is top university in Kazakhstan and it's a trendsetter. That's why I had a great opportunity in my life to be, uh, to put the first cornerstone up and to be the bridge in the wall of misunderstanding and miscommunication. Thank you. Thank you so much, Sultan. Thank you for joining us. Uh, Torin, would you be able to introduce yourself and a little bit about your work? Yes, of course. Hi, everybody. Great to see you all. My name is Torin. My pronouns are she, her, um, and I am an Irish trans woman. Uh, I currently am the co-chair at Iglio, uh, along with my colleague, Ralu. Um, and I'm currently employed in the UK, so I have crossed a, a historical divide <laughs> uh, to move my activism from our Ireland to UK context in recent years. I'm currently the trans engagement manager at Stonewall UK. Is that everything you would like to know, Bella? Perfect. Thank you so much. And Oscar, you have introduced yourself, but maybe again and a little bit more. Yeah, there's a slightly different introduction that I can give mm -hmm. with a different hat on. So hello, my name is Oscar. My pronouns are he, him, his. As I said, I am an activist based in Dublin, Ireland. I am both trans and intersex, and I find that it's always worth bringing that to the table at the beginning of every conversation. Um, I am also an artist. I have recently trained in new media and digital culture, and I do research on hate speech online, how radicalization works online, how algorithms can radicalize people and sort of how that intersects with the current issues in the UK and Ireland of massive media transphobia, which is a systemic, intentional, well-funded, orchestrated attack on all of us. Um, so I'm really excited to be joining you here today with a, a slightly different capacity because usually I sort of sit here as an organizer. So it's nice to be able to join with an activist voice as well. Thank you all so much for joining us. I think it's great that we have a mixture of, you know, um, 
someone working in a global organization, someone working in a national organization, and um, you know yourself, Sultan, who's a, in, an independent activist in many ways, which I'm sure has its own benefits and setbacks. Um, you know, sometimes it's nice to work within a structure with a lot of support, and sometimes that's extremely frustrating <laughs> at the same time. Uh, both of these things can be true at once. I'm going to I'm gonna dive right in, and I'm going to go first to Torin, um, and I think I might have an idea about your answer considering where geographically you sit in terms of your work. What are some of the main challenges you face in your work? Yeah, I think what you're referencing is obviously the anti-trans movement that we've seen a lot of kind of gain a lot of ground in recent years. And um, I think it's it's a real challenge for everyone. And I think it's going to continue to spread. It kind of started in the UK and then we saw decisions in other parts of Europe and then it started to pick up ground in Ireland. And I think this is kind of unfortunately trans people are just the newest marginalized group or the newest group that people can pick on and that not everyone has met a trans person not everyone knows a trans person so it's easy to believe the lies about trans people um, and I think yeah we've been seeing the narrative spread quite quickly a lot of it spread by the UK media and a specific bias within UK media um, and specifically people high up in UK media have just decided they don't like trans people this is the thing that they now don't like so it's been a real challenge a lot of my work in the last four years. I've been based in the UK for the last four years. And originally I joined Stonewall to just do trans engagement, to just engage with trans communities, figure it out, out how the organization could have better relationships with trans communities and build bridges. Unfortunately, in those four years, most of my work has actually been spent combating the anti-trans movement and the effects they have in our community and the damage they're doing and the, the setbacks that that's causing in the UK. So I think that's really one of the biggest challenges to my work universally. I think one of the biggest challenges to youth activism generally is just kind of, oh, hello, Kat. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think one of the biggest challenges to youth activism specifically is, is just the patronizing nature we're often kind of treated with. A lot of the time, LGBT people aren't taken very seriously, LGBT adults perhaps a little bit more, but we're still kind of seen as fatty or not knowing ourselves and just making things up. Um, and when you apply that to a youth context, it's really, really hard to get decision makers and change makers to take young people seriously when they're advocating for themselves. So I think they would be probably my two biggest challenges, if that makes sense. Absolutely. And I think speaking on that uh, from a youth perspective, I know, Oscar, you are the youth consultant. Um, so you probably have to face that and making sure youth have a voice, which is every bit the reason we are gathered here today. Um, what are some of your challenges in making sure youth voices are heard? I mean, there's, there's a couple of perspectives here about where the challenges are. I mean, one of the main things that we do as the Global Career Youth Network um, is to try and meaningfully engage youth voices. And I think that that's our key word here is the meaning, because so often I think youth voices are brought to the table as a very showy, we're just carting out the young person for this one moment. Um, so I think it's really important for us to understand why and how youth are being brought to the table and what they're doing there. And um, it's not just enough for, it to be, to, for us to be in the room. There has to be a meaningful reason for us to be sitting at this table. People have to take the youth opinion seriously. And um, I think uh, so many of us are probably going to repeat the same thing where often youth are discredited purely for their age, regardless of their experience or the thing that they're trying to bring to the table. There's a lot of really valuable um, experiences and really valuable input that youth can and do give. And I think that's what we've seen through the Career Youth Dialogues over this past year. Another main challenge that we're getting is, as Torin says, is this backlash. It's this level of people that are just fundamentally disagreeing with our existence. And I think the phrase that we were uh, we constantly using, I think I heard it said over the past couple of days in the outrights in a summit was, uh, if you don't respect our existence, expect our resistance. Um, it's really important for all of us, I think, here to understand that the youth voice is an immovable force, um, regardless of all of this uh, pushback that we are constantly experiencing, whatever the new face of this pushback is, whether it's disregarding trans voices, disregarding intersex voices, disregarding women's voices, disregarding people's uh, need for reproductive health care. All of these intersectional issues are youth issues, and there's not really an alternative to the, the progress of change. And um, so I think that the best thing that we've been able to see through this viewing of resistance and viewing of people uh, 
fighting against us is that we don't really take no for an answer. Uh, youth can and will and do continue. Um, and I think that's a really empowering sentiment. Um, it's exhausting that we have to have an empowering sentiment just to even begin a conversation. But I think that it's, um, it's an exciting space to be in every single time. It's always a youth space. It's always a really innovative, really passionate space. Um, I think that's why we all continue to do this. Absolutely. Um, I love that. If you don't respect our existence, expect our, res our, resi our, uh, the way you said it. It's a tongue twister. <laughs> Thank you. I'd just like to remind, um, particularly the Irish panelists, um, that we, we will, uh, slow down our normal canter. Um, we normally speak very, very fast, um, because we have a lot to say, but yeah, I absolutely, and that reflects in my work as well. Um, because I, I work in school settings. So while Ireland is considered to have progressed very far, most of our legislation that people are referencing do not impact young people. Young people aren't getting married and young people can't access gender recognition certificates. It's kind of complicated. There is a way you can do it when you are 16 years old, but it's very convoluted, almost takes two years. So you pretty much just have to wait till you're over 18. So therefore, school-aged people are not really impacted by the progress Ireland has made. And that's one of the challenges. Uh, Sultan, I'd like to come to you now. Uh, what are some of the main challenges facing you in, in your work? So uh, I would totally agree with Torin on uh, uh, that those decision makers, they can be very patronizing in their voices. And I would totally agree with Oscar that uh, youth voice is usually discredited. So, and uh, my activism is in the context of Kazakhstan, uh, the country where one party rules and the uh, youth is not represented in the party except for one person called Madi Akhmetov. He's the youngest uh, and probably the only deputy. So, uh, and the, we are not even talking about LGBTQI rights or women rights. Um, we like the youth is generally not represented and totally discredited and patronized. If we're going to talk about youth problems in uh, the university where I studied, uh, it, my activism started just as like seminars and whatever, like visibility and just talking to other gay people, building a family and community. However, we really demanded some kind of um, uh, like jurisdiction, like legal things, some papers, what can protect us because we really felt unprotected at that time. Because uh, the university was Western, um, uh, how to say, the media based and all the professors were Westerners or, or either they studied in Western countries and they brought different ideas and one of those was like human rights and we, felt that it's an, it's an opportunity for every queer at that university to kind of fight for it. However, we were not hurt. We were always neglected. We were always uh, discriminated and repressed, oppressed, like whatever may happen to a youth, what can be a bit voiceful, we faced every single bit of uh, hardness. However, we started to be hurt only after a couple of suicides. Uh, among our LGBTQI members. And what I really do not like about my country, and I'm really ashamed that we have to basically die in order to be heard. And what kind of voice we, we can at the end like deliver, right? If we die like at the middle of, uh, and I have uh, already, I'm 27 now, I have, um, uh, how to say, I have lost four friends and I think it's not normal. And that this pattern is usually usually visible in uh, in Kazakhstan. There is a high su suicide rate uh, among youth, and uh, I know that LGBTQI members are one of those who are very close to such kind of decision. So the hardship is that we are not hurt, we are totally discredited, we are patronized, uh, and not as LGBTQI, but I would say rather as just youth. Yeah, it's like talking general, right? Um, yeah, so, but personally, I would be very glad if LGBTQI will be ever recognized in Kazakhstan. Thank you. Thank you, Sultan. And I think it, it's important to note that we, we've, I would say we have probably all lost friends this way and it's so difficult. And I think 
sometimes that that patronizing nature from society at large makes us feel that this is not life and death when in fact it very much is life and death for our for our friends and our siblings who are who are dying um be, because we are not getting the the human rights we need and deserve and it sounds like you are fighting battles on on many fronts in this regard in Kazakhstan so thank you for bringing that perspective um i'm going to try to ask um uh how we can focus on the the opportunities um and best practices for meaningful youth activism uh i think we are facing more challenges than ever before i think um many people expect linear progression that has not happened i feel my job was easier five years ago than it is today i definitely feel this um at the same time i think we have uh more vocal people against us than maybe ever before, but also more people um, for us, more allies, more active allies. So I, I'll go to to Oscar. What is some of the biggest opportunities you have observed for meaningful youth activism? I think the key word in this is intersectionality. And um, I have found nothing but support, resilience, and passion from all other intersections of activist movements, <clears throat> whether that's peace building, climate action, habitat, um, SRHR, sexual health and reproductive health care uh, rights, or whatever the intersection is, not only do I find that many other activists in these spaces intersect on a queer or LGBTIQ identity spectrum, they're also just intersecting our issues of believing in our human rights and dignity, regardless of their uh, membership to our community. So I think that it's absolutely vital that we engage and activate all allies that we have in intersectional spaces because they can bring our issues to the table whenever we're not at the table. Because there is no climate justice without racial justice. There is no racial justice without queer justice. All of these things cannot happen independently. Um, so I think that it's beautiful and poetic to be able to activate all of our intersectional allies uh, and how that happens it's for us to bring to the table. It's important for us to make those uh, networking opportunities. It's important for us to find those allies and to bring people along on the journey. Something that I think I often talk about in, our, in my activism is to meet people where they're at and then bring them along on the rest of the way. And um, I find that people are generally quite open to engaging in queer activist spaces, specifically from an intersex perspective, we cannot do this without allies. There is no way that we as intersex people are able to achieve the justice that we need without the support of our allies, um, particularly in the trans community because so many of our issues are overlapping and intersecting. And that just means that it's two historically oppressed groups and historically smaller groups are trying to fight the same fight in a lot of ways. So this is where the intersection, uh, the intersectional allyship really has to become to the forefront there is no way that my intersex community is going to be able to achieve what we need, which is uh, the end of general mutilation on intersex uh, infants, the end of sterilization in, on intersex people, more inclusive sexual education, uh, more inclusive healthcare and equal healthcare access. All of those things are also trans issues. They're also women's health issues. They're also sexual health and reproductive healthcare rights issues. And um, so the flag of intersectionality is also very much the flag of the intersex community. Oh, I, I completely agree. I always feel like um, the liberation of the intersex community is the liberation for us all. Um, and they're, they're just experiencing such intersectionality in terms of um, bioessentialism, um, lack of autonomy, um, and also malpractice from the medical uh, field and you know I think um, often we, we talk about um, police and their their lack of um, constructive <laughs> contribution to our community and our, our liberation but I also feel like there is such systematic problems within the medical field you know uh, as well I would almost say ADAB, um, you know, all doctors are bastards. I, I'm not sure if that's 100% true, but it feels like that if they're operating within systematic um, oppression, it's a big problem. Um, with regards to intersectionality, uh, Sultan, 
Do you find that that is something, as you've said, you were working from a perspective where youth in general are not being taken seriously, and then you're intersecting with whether that youth is LGBT or from a disabled or other things. How do you implement um, ensuring voices are heard when, when you were working um, from an intersectional point of view? Uh, yeah, intersectionality was never a, uh, a question uh, for discussion between all the activists I know in Kazakhstan. We all agree that intersectionality is the main thing what uh, makes our uh, experience kind of voiceful and can uh, connect uh, like to different uh, other people and we can have a like a consensus on some issues. Uh, but I would also add to uh, Oscar's uh, saying, so intersectionality has uh, no <laughs> battle okay, from my side. I totally support that. And I think that's the only way how we can uh, like survive or we can connect. Uh, the, 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 one of the challenge was uh, the lack of um, any research uh, on LGBTQI people or intersectionality or history um, for Kazakh culture, we never existed and we are not going to exist. We're gonna be eliminated soon. So, and the, that voice or that idea is kind of quite common and it is very, um, it's a disaster, uh, per, personal what I think. And the, as a scientist uh, who is pursuing his PhD uh, degree now, I want to rely on real research and advocate based on research that if we're gonna talk about intersectionality that we have, let's say that 55% of our government are women, but they are underrepresented. Where, where are all these women? Are they just janitors or are they decision makers? The same for every other minority group. Um, I would uh, kindly probably support any kind of research on intersectionality. Uh, but we also started that at university uh, and that was the um, um, uh, initi initiative of our, of our faculty members. Um, however, the research um, I think was not published yet and we don't know the, and it, it's only in the limit of one university, but we are what we are talking about the scale of whole country, right? and all cities and every piece of it, what can represent um, like locally uh, the voices. Thank you. I hope I answered your question and I may oh. like a little <laughs> away. <laughs> Absolutely. I, I love what you said about uh, the representation of, of women and you know how feminism and the LGBT movement uh, can and should work together. And we've seen that happen differently in different places. Um, I think, for example, um, Malta um, is a country that has many uh, legal protections for LGBTQ plus people, but still no abortion rights. Um, and actually, they're, what I find interesting when, when I went to Malta is that their Catholic church is very involved in LGBT inclusion, which is something as an Irish person, I can't even imagine because um our our catholic church here not 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 so involved in lgbt rights um and i would say also um irish feminism has moved in conjunction with lgbt rights however due to the patriarchy and how strongly embedded the patriarchy is in ireland and because our, our gay rights movement was very much led by middle-class, white, able-bodied men, actually we got decriminalization before we got divorce. Now, divorce might not seem like a woman's issue, but it very much is because um, women need to be able to leave abusive relationships, which many of them were in Ireland. And we got marriage equality before we got abortion. You know, um, interesting. And I, I say also in the UK, this is where what the narrative is, is that LGBT rights and um, feminism are at loggerheads when that is obviously not the case in reality. But Torin, I would wonder if you could speak to that from, from a youth activist perspective um, when you're dealing with uh, second wave feminists that have only ever considered their rights in, in a very narrow perspective white feminism we would call it because feminism began with 
um, once there was some liberation of, of some black communities, then then white women said, you can't be treating us as badly as you treat black people. <laughs> and that's where white feminism kind of came from. What we are seeing is um, a real death rattle of that way of thinking. Um, and I was just wondering if you could speak a little bit to how feminism and the LGBT movement from a youth activist um, perspective works in the UK or doesn't work in the UK. Yeah, I think it's important to note that as you kind of mentioned, a lot of the people who are very anti-trans are not our generation. There are very, very few people who are kind of actively advocating anti-trans positions that are of this generation. Um, it does seem to be very much a kind of reactionary thing from older, predominantly white women um, who, for whatever reason, seem to think that trans people are going to take away some of their rights, despite the fact there has been gender recognition legislation in the UK for 15 years now, and that hasn't been the case. I think it's, it's, it's very essential for the younger generation and for youth activists that feminist activists and trans activists are very, very well connected because we're the kind of two types of marginalized groups um, that are very, very strongly experience marginalization based on our gender, based on the gender that we hold um, and the issues that are tied up in the fight for trans rights, which are things like bodily autonomy and being able to access the medications and the healthcare you need at the time you need it and not jumping through doctor's hoops and jumping through medical practitioner's hoops. These are the same issues we see women facing in healthcare settings. We see women who know that they will never want to have children, have no interest having children, have medical conditions that make a hysterectomy a, a good option for them. And we see doctors saying, no, you can't have that. Your body is this vessel for bringing new life into the earth, uh, which is this incredibly problematic way of thinking. And I think we're only going to change that very established thinking of trans people and women work together. We have to kind of broaden this understanding of gender um, and really kind of, I, I think that the, 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 the anti-trans movement is very well funded from other places and by hate groups and by really, really problematic organizations that just don't like anyone who isn't a white cis man. And I think by creating this false dichotomy and by creating this false kind of conflict, there's this, there's this kind of, well, if we have just women fighting trans people and trans people fighting women and everyone fighting each other, no one's looking at the patriarchy, no one's looking at white cis men and no one's paying attention to us. So I think it's a very manufactured crisis. I think it's a manufactured conflict. And I think by kind of feeding into it, and I think a lot of these women who are feeding into this conflict and are feeding into it and provoking trans people and attacking trans people, they're not setting trans rights back years. Well, they are, but they're not alone setting trans rights back years. They're setting women's rights back years. We're not, there. there's so much energy that even has to come from feminist activists who are allies to trans people to defend trans people that they're not focusing on helping women. There's so many people who would love to be out there doing work that makes a real difference in everyday women's lives, but they're fighting turfs online for trans people because of this manufactured conflict. So I think, I think it's a flash in the pan moment. I think we're in a strange time in history when this has all been manufactured, but if we want to get past this and if we want to fix the trouble it's caused, and if we want a better world for women and trans people, I think strong allyship and strong shows of public allyship between feminist activism activists and trans activists are really, really important. Absolutely. Um, I think that, you know, obviously it's, it's, um, it's, it's important to, to note the difficult time we're in and the many challenges that face us. Um, but also, I think there has been a lot to be hopeful about in terms of how, I guess, the internet can be a place of a lot of hate, um, uh, but it can also be a place of extreme community, like right here, you know, um, we are all connected from across many, many countries because, because we can be um, where before this type of gathering would have only been available for those who could take time to travel, take time off work, who had the money uh, to do so. So there, there are some things to be, to be hopeful about. And I guess because we are hoping to, to spark <laughs> youth activists to, to keep on going, it is really important that we um, mindfully focus on, on uh, the, the, the positive as well, Torn. 
Yeah, just on the positive, because I think that is really essential. I think this has been a horrible time for a lot of trans communities and a lot of queer people in general to see members of their community being attacked. But I think if I can like take a positive out of this is I know queer women have my back. I know queer cis women care so deeply for their trans sisters. And I didn't know that. I didn't always inherently know that. I always saw myself as an outsider with other queer women. I was like, well, yes, I am a queer woman, but I'm a trans woman. So I'm not really part of that group. I always felt myself an outsider. And I think it's been really incredible how like queer cis women, despite the fact they're cis, they're still women and they're still queer people. They still face a lot of their own marginalization. And I think how quickly so many lesbians and bi women and asexual women have turned to support trans people. I think it's been incredible. And I think it, it really shows that those links are there and they're very, very strong and people are trying to tear them apart, but I think they'll, they'll stand it and we'll be 50 years down the line and feminist activists and trans activists will be laughing about that time, those nut jobs from the UK trying to burn everything down. So it has been, a, it's been a real kind of, it has been a brilliant moment for seeing that solidarity. It's just a pity it had to come at such a huge cost, I think. Absolutely, yes. Um, I think that there is a huge amount of solidarity uh, and I often wonder with the bio-essentialist um, turfs out there, how much they uh, do feel connected to their womanhood because they don't seem to. Like I feel extremely connected to my womanhood in a way that means I am very connected to trans women. I feel that um, I am in a group of people that includes some cis and some trans women who are doing womanhood on purpose. That's how I would describe my gender. It's on purpose. Uh, I would think of my gender if it's a tree, it's not the leaves, it's the roots. It's the bit actually you can't see and therefore I'm connected by those roots to all women um, and, and trans women, of course, as well. Um, Oscar, I want to come in there with um, some some hope that you feel from a kind of global perspective, because you were working in Ilga world. Um, you were seeing many things play out uh, at once. What uh, what are some things that give you hope? Yeah, and my cat has just decided to jump across the table for a second. Um, but I think it's hope is really a huge tenet of all of the work that I do. I actually have the word hope tattooed in Irish on my body. I think hope is a really powerful force. Um, so I think that all of the work that we've been doing through this past year with the Global Queer Youth Network, with the Queer Youth Dialogues, has had this through line of resilience, hope and resistance. Um, while it is a shame that our population has to be resilient, hopeful uh, and resistive, we are that and we continue to be that. I think that one of the most amazing parts of these past couple of years has been being able to see how the digital space can become a really powerful tool for activism and connection with people. Um, everyone in this space, bar I think a handful, I had never met before the pandemic. I'd never met or worked with many of you before. And we've been working together almost every day, making really transformative, impactful and sustainable change. And being able as young people to use digital tools to the fullest of their ability whenever we have access is a really powerful thing. So I think that while that is very true, it's also really important for us to uh, understand and explore the digital divide and the lack of access to technology and how the pandemic has also widened that gap. What If we're able to use the internet as a really powerful, wonderful tool, it's vital that everyone has access to that. And then another sort of through line of hope that I think is really important to mention is that we have a huge amount of partnership and support from other agencies, from higher up agencies in the UN from the Independent Expert on Sexual Orientation and Gender Identity to the UN's Youth Envoy. There are dozens of individuals, agencies and organizations that choose to champion LGBT rights. They choose to be allies with us and they continue to do that even against all the backlash. And I think as Torin said earlier, it's absolutely vital moving forward that all of our allies are steadfast in that allyship and really vocal about it. There are no if, ands, or buts about LGBT inclu inclusion in all spaces. And it's not good enough for people to fly that flag during June. It's not just during Pride, it is 24 seven, 365, as many hours you can fit into the day. I know all of us in this space, 24 seven, 365 is how we exist. I don't take off 
my intersex hat at any point during the day. I don't take off my queer hat at any point during the day. There can be nothing about me without me, and I'm me 24 seven. So having all of our allies understand that and really push that for us in spaces that we're not invited to, that does happen, it is happening. Um, and as we said earlier, it's just a matter of making sure these allies understand what their seat at the table is and how to best champion our allyship. Absolutely. Um, Sultan, I want to ask you now about hope from a perspective where you are working in university activism, which is such a fertile bed for amazing change and activism. I think university settings are very interesting because they tend to be classist institutions in many ways. A university is sometimes only accessible to, to rich people. And even if that is not the case today, they were set up that way. So there are structural reasons why they are classes. But they are also institutions that are um, hoping to get to the truth. <laughs> and there are reasons why um, uh, so much uh, positive activism um, between, um, say, fighting racism has come from universities. Um, a lot of change has come from the university. So what makes you hopeful from, from an academic point of view in terms of your activism for, for the future? So um, as a student uh, of a top university, I felt that responsibility that I was on a scholarship from a very poor background, let's say, financially. <clears throat> that is why I, I was thinking always like all this Kazakhstani people, they are paying tremendous amount of money so I can just have another assignment submitted late, <laughs> right? So, <laughs> uh, and uh, the question was like, what can I offer back? Uh, and uh, in a university where every other person is gonna be a decision maker in the future of Kazakhstan. It, it is my pleasure to be the person who gonna be uh, the breach in ignorance re regarding uh, queer uh, uh, youth, right? Or just queer people. Just, just to show that we exist, we are not dangerous. We are just regular. We are also patriots. We are also scientists. We are just as everybody else. But the some choices what we have uh, made for ourselves is a kind of can be different. Like, um, so I have like a very big hope. I have also today a very symbolical dress uh, in 2012 when I was just admitted to that university. Having colorful dress was a very gay thing, and <laughs> and uh, in 10 years, right? 10. It's a whole decade past. The university invited me to uh, celebrate Pride. is is just ten years. I know that I digged up a little bit of a negative side of the history of our university, but history can be bitter for every kind of activism. However, if there are younger people who are gonna listen to me, I would say the best part of that history is when you're gonna win. And uh, what I would say that we gonna eventually win all this battle because that's the tendency. Yes, it's not beautifully linear. It's very messed up. However, it's going up uh, towards the, uh, I don't know, just admitting that we exist and our rights are essential as everybody else rights. Uh, yeah, so hope sometimes is the last thing and the only thing what you can have. Um, however, it is such a delicious feeling. <laughs> uh, sometimes it, it is the only thing what makes you do another step. Uh, sometimes it uh, keeps you alive and work. Um, yeah, so probably this, this will be my words on hope. <laughs> uh, yeah, uh, so it is, it is the most important thing and we all definitely have hope. And if we're gonna lose the uh, hope, we, it means that we lost. But, I think we should not lose it. Thank you. Absolutely. Thank you so much. They can't take our hope. Um, I would just invite uh, anybody who would like to submit a question to do so as we come uh, wrap up shortly. Um, I would like to ask a kind of final question. It's a, it's a little bit different. Um, when I started out uh, I, as a LGBTQ plus activist, uh, I had 
two other jobs. It was my third job was being an activist and I would meet uh, people who worked in NGOs and people I really respected uh, who I would meet in this type of setting, speaking on a panel or something. And I would think, well, I can never be like that. They must be 100% on the ball all of the time, which is absolutely not true. <laughs> um, that's something I've learned. So um, just to, I guess, ensure that everyone knows that we're, we're, we are not made of different stuff than you. We are not more resilient. Um, we maybe have just built some practices around resilience. So I'd like to ask you about that. I think um, the concept of self-care has been unfortunately really co-opted by capitalism and used um, to kind of, uh, well, one, put make an, uh, a systematic problem seem like an individual problem. If you are not handling your stress pro properly, that is your problem and you need to go and buy a face mask or whatever to, to make yourself feel better and then get back to work. <laughs> um, now, a lot of the advice to rail against that speaks to people who are working for, for capitalism. Um, but sometimes you do need to rail against it even when you are working for an NGO or working for academia. Um, and then, you know, they really have tried to, to make it, it, I think it's referred to as Mac mindfulness, where you know, the corporates are like, well, we're not gonna give you more pay, but here's a mindfulness course or something. It annoys me so much. However, it's important at the same time to not be completely uh, disincentivized from the concept of self-care. So I'd like to ask you, now, what, what do you do to, to decompress um, when Twitter is too much and uh, politics is too much and the weight of the world is too much because um, it is hard to fight for um, yourself? Um, and sometimes we are um, not putting ourselves in that position. I remember when... Um, more lockdown came came in place in Ireland, I said, that's gonna be so hard for the community, the LGBT community. I am, I am that, I am the LGBT community. It's hard for me, it sucks. I was meant to go for dinner last night with my friends and it got canceled and I am lonely. So I, I guess I will also say what, what helps me. Um, what helps me is um, watching absolute trash. What could only be described as trash. Uh, right now, I'm watching Selling Sunset, and it's everything I hate about the world, but I love it so much, <laughs> and I do not call it a guilty pleasure. It is simply a pleasure, and I also eat. I eat a lot. I love eating. Um, I love eating, like, large amounts of things, like um, like a whole family-sized chocolate bar or a whole bag of biscuits, not just three, like the whole thing, and I do that um on purpose again I'm not <laughs> this is something I'm doing actively so um I'll go to you Oscar um what do you do to look after yourself it's a really important question I think that something that I didn't have earlier on in like my activist career and even before I was doing it as a professional position I didn't have a huge huge toolkit to call upon and I would find myself getting very burnt out very quickly or in doing an event like this, for example, if I maybe uh, felt like I gave too much to a space, I would then feel very empty after the session and it would be um, a damaging moment, I guess, to be so tired and to feel so vulnerable, especially in this context when you're doing it over Zoom. So once you've sort of opened yourself up to this vulnerable space, you then close it and you're on your own again. So I think it's really important for me to, I've built a really strong community around me. I have some wonderful friends. They're not all members of the LGBT community, but they're all understanding allies. I wouldn't have friends who are otherwise. And they really understand how taxing doing activist work can be because in many other positions, let's say you're a doctor, you're a teacher, your job is very tiring, of course, but you're not expected to open your entire heart every single time you step into a space. You're not expected to deliver your entire life story. You're not expected to unearth trauma every single day. And that's something that we are expected to do, especially when you're in civil society spaces where you're trying to convince someone to care. The best way of convincing someone to care is to tell them the worst thing that's happened. So I would often tell, um, at some point several years ago, I was the victim of uh, quite a violent hate crime. And that's something that I often bring to a table. And in the beginning of talking about that, 
I didn't have the toolkit to be able to safely do that, but I was doing it anyway because I felt it was an obligation as a queer activist to be 100% every single time, to be transparent and honest, even at the damage of my own mental well-being. And that's something that I've had to start checking myself on. It's been really important for me to acknowledge where my limits are and where I feel comfortable in the disclosing information, in what spaces I'm disclosing certain information and to who and what they could potentially, uh, how, how that dialogue could then go. So having a huge support network around you is absolutely vital. Having that in person where possible as well, being able to go to a person and get a hug is really important. We need that physical affection. Uh, I have a really well curated blocked word list on Twitter. I block many words, many accounts. Uh, every couple of days, I add more words to that blocked list. Um, and that's on my personal account, not my work account, which means that I can go to bat and just see jokes. I don't see all the terrible things that often happen. I don't feel the need to engage with that 24 seven. And then the other thing that I think uh, Bella, you've already said is to have other interests, have other hobbies, do something else, spend 300 hours playing Animal Crossing, come visit my island. It's an absolute delight. You need to do those other things that bring you joy because while activism and while this fight brings me an immense amount of joy, it's also incredibly tiring, taxing and draining on my mental well-being. Knowing when to take breaks, knowing when to ask for help and knowing when to pull back and say, this is enough for me right now. I'm going to take this time. I'm not going to bring this piece of information. Uh, I think that in a lot of our activist spaces, we're really transparent about our mental health needs and our needs, period. So I find uh, I've never had an experience where someone resists that, where someone calls me out and says, no, you can't take a self-care moment. It's really up to ourselves to advocate for ourselves in this way. No one's going to do it for you. No one understands that you may be experiencing some sort of anguish or hardship. You have to make sure you're vocal about your needs. And that in and of itself can be quite difficult to be vulnerable and say, I'm having a difficult moment. So the best thing that I have learned in all of my activism has been to be my own advocate, regardless of what intersection of issue I'm talking about. I always bring my needs to the table first and look, at, look after myself first. A little bit selfish, but it's absolutely required for self-preservation. Absolutely. Thank you so much. Torn. what do you do to make sure that you are able to continue? <laughs> I think kind of touching on, on what you've been, kind of been saying, I think turning off is very, very important. I think it's a bit of a cliche to say, oh, we should turn off. Uh, but I absolutely think it's essential. I've been working professionally supporting trans communities for six years since I was 21. And it's only in the last year or two that I realized I don't have to be the perfect trans person for the cis people I work with. I don't have to know every fact. I don't have to watch problematic TV debates that upset me. I can have my boundaries. I don't have to engage with things that are upsetting just to prove that I'm I'm here. And it's it's difficult for me. I'm I'm uh, a working class person. I'm often surrounded by people who have gone to Oxford and Cambridge and and use overly complicated language and use all of these kind of like Chatham House rules or something they love to say. Still don't know what that means. It's some sort of rules for engagement or something in the UK. Um, and it's really difficult as a working class person not to feel that I have to be the most engaged and the most informed to be valid there. But you don't. You, you will eventually reach a point where you burn out. That's not sustainable. No one can keep going, keep knowing every bit of information, keep reading, keep watching forever. It's exhausting. You really, really need to be more complex than just your queer identity you need to have other interests my uh go-to is star wars i think more people should get into star wars i'm a massive star wars fan the name Torin was a random name that i picked up from a random rebel communications officer in a star wars book and she made sure everyone else got off the planet safe and she stayed behind and these stories give us kind of a a, a full blueprint or a full map of how this kind of thing go happens an empire rises there's a rebellion the empire falls and things get better one of my favorite quotes ever from star wars and um, is 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 a quote from a character called Jyn Erso and it's rebellions are built on hope and if this this queer movement that we're kind of engaging in isn't a rebellion I don't know what it is so I think yeah seeing your own self and seeing our movement and seeing our struggles in 
characters that are Wookiees and, and little green Yodas and baby Yodas and seeing that play out in something that's a little bit removed can kind of subconsciously remind you that, yeah, things are bad now, but they'll get better. And, and you don't have to think about it. You can just kind of forget your trans for, well, two and a half hours if you're watching a Star Wars movie, they're not sure. Uh, but yeah, I think switching off, it, it's so cliche and I hate to sound like a broken record, but you don't have to be on all the time. You don't have to be an activist up until midnight and then pass out and then you're an activist at 6 a.m. again the next morning. You deserve the same like rest and relaxation as everyone else. It often feels because there's so few paid positions or it's so difficult. And we know a lot of the organizations that work on this are dominated by kind of cis and, and middle class people. We can often feel we have to prove things to others, but you don't, you don't have to prove anything to anyone. You're a part of a, a movement and you're an important part and we need you here in five years, not kind of burnt out and wishing you'd never even met any of us and never engaged in any of these, these kind of events. I think, yeah, turning off. I'm watching Star Wars. Everyone just go watch Star Wars when we're done today. <laughs> Thank you, Torrin. I also don't know what Chatham House rules are. I just got, I've gotten so used to not knowing many things that I'm just like, I let it just wash over me. I'm like, if it's important, someone will tell me. Sultan, what do you do to look after yourself and make sure that you are able to, to continue the fight? So my activism, activism gave me lots of PTSD, depression, and anxiety. And I'm very thankful for, <laughs> and I think that's the gift now for the rest of my life. So uh, I actually delivered my activism to the beautiful souls um, throughout, uh, like to all of my, I was a teacher, I was like teaching like uh, in many places and I, I delivered that opportunity for the younger people so they can advocate with their better voice. Probably mine is outdated and less intersectional, less inclusive. <laughs> Who knows, right? But I'm going to the next level. So I think that as an academic, I have to do something academic, something important, and uh, be a role model for this one, because I know that I'm probably the first gay scientist from Kazakhstan. <laughs> and I have to do something incredible with my work. So people can refer and say like, oh, you see that guy existed and he did very incredible job and blah, blah, blah. And so we can do, um, yeah. So, but how I deal with all the gifts I was <laughs> given, um, I do gardening. It is extremely good thing. Um, I grow my own ingredients, then I cook my own food and in a cultural national way. And I try to feed all of my roommates because they are all men who are above 30 and they're all married and they last time cooked when they were 18. <laughs> <laughs> so I feel the mama of the house <laughs> for, for that, <laughs> you know, like, uh, what else I do? Yeah, I also watch trashy stuff. Uh, just to forget this another day. Um, and sometimes when I'm very desperate and when I have lots of energy during the night, I go to my garden and dance under the moon, but only during the night. So my neighbors would not see that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's it's very like, I'm more directed to nature and I'm practicing queer sober ideas that queer people don't have to be addicted to drugs or alcohol or whatever. But, we have lots of chemsex and it's a whole new topic right old topic but lots of talk about so i'm trying to practice the sober ideas um just trying to make my one day um a better version of myself so the new generation at least look at me and say that there is an option not committing suicide but making your life better and just fight for it yeah so amazing yeah, thank you, <laughs> thank, you. <laughs> thank you so much and i think it's all very exciting for us to that we have a panel with the kazakhstan's first openly gay scientist will in 20 years will say i went to a panel talk with sultan years ago before before he was famous um thank you 
all so much for sharing that. I hope this was helpful for folks to feel feel hopeful and feel like you you can take those breaks, whatever they look like for you. Um, try to take them on purpose. There's a little bit of a difference between taking a break on purpose and scrolling on TikTok for four hours because you can't cope. And I do both of those. But you know, always better to to uh, to take your breaks on purpose. Uh, thank you all so much. I'm going to hand back now to our hosts, and I believe we are in 